What's up, Isaac? Hey, what's up, Chris? Hey, guys, sorry for being late this morning. Um, mm. Hey, my uh, – so I'm, I'm – and if you covered this, then just slap me. But mm -hmm. I was uh, just – obviously, you guys are dealing with a lot of leader development with this, like the guys that are going to be leading groups or hosting those Discovery Bible things. So I'm just kind of interested on – what are you looking for in appointing those? And then uh, how are you training once you identify those? Um, I'm, just, yeah. I'm just really interested on uh, that because we're, we're seeing reaching people and plugging them in. I, and I've got some faithful guys, you know, but just curious how you guys went about doing that. We're, we're not in a staff situation. So a lot, everything we're doing is with uh, laymen. Um, but uh but I know you guys are seeing that too, where people are coming in, they're growing, they're demonstrating fruit, maturity, and, and they're excited. They want to maybe lead a group or you just identify them and you're like, hey, I think you could be a good fit for this. How are you guys doing that or what have you done uh, with, with that? Sure, Isaac. Great question. And I'll speak to this both from, Isaac, the perspective of leaders that are already believers and leaders that we're seeing come up from among the lost. So I'm yep. not sure exactly which direction you're talking, but I'll, I'll speak yep. to both. So, um, so I, I would say this, there was a group of, uh, there was a panel of like CPM uh, practitioners. Um, they had a meeting, I think in India or somewhere a number of years ago. Stan, I wasn't there, unfortunately, Stan was telling me about it. And somebody raised their hand and just said, hey, how do you, um, what, what are the characteristics of leaders? Or how do you identify leaders? And they all started laughing. <laughs> and, uh, and the guy was kind of going, What's, what's, why is it so funny? And they said, you never know at the beginning who the leader is and, and, um, and you know, which ones are leaders. He's, they all, basically all the catalysts agreed. You train every believer and even the unbelievers that are, you know, beginning to follow Jesus. You train everybody and then you discover who the leaders are by seeing who starts leading. So I thought that was super interesting because, you know, so in, in kind of our context, it's like, Okay, we're looking for a guy that can do this and, you know, the, these characteristics and whatever. And this, this is going to be the catalytic person. This is going to be somebody that's going to be really good at this. And all those CPM catalysts all acknowledge you can't pick them. In fact, Isaac, the best leaders are the people you would have never picked. And the people you would have picked to lead don't end up leading very well. It's kind of their experience. And so yeah. Isaac, kind of, kind of the, the theory overseas is train everybody. Train yeah. everybody. So even in kind of our DMM process, when we see churches get started, once the church starts to grow and we start training, we don't try to identify, Isaac, leaders in the church. We train everybody and say, God can use you to be a leader, and we see who rises up and starts leading people. Gotcha. So instead of identifying leaders, we discover who are the, the folks that are actually leading. And, and then I would say, uh, Isaac, on, the, um, you know, on the, the church staff's side of things, in the same way with our staff, we trained everybody and we were able to see in time who was going to catch this vision and move forward with us, who was going to move on and do something different. And so we've just tried to assume, Isaac, just because we were leaders on a mega church staff doesn't mean we would necessarily be the most fruitful leaders in this. That's why all of us went and got jobs, because even though we had the resources to pay folks, we want to pay the folks that are most effective, and we don't want to assume we're going to be the most effective right from the beginning. We're going to wait and see who the Lord uses, who bears the most fruit, and when somebody starts 2,000 groups, we'll hire him. You know what I'm saying? And that may be me, or that may be somebody else, but it may not be. So we're not even assuming as leaders of a mega church that we would be the leaders that should be hired or paid or doing this full time. So that's kind of why we all went back to work, because one of the uh, principles and movements around the world is – the indigenous people aren't often paid until they started 2000 groups indicating they should be paid because of the management that's involved with the groups. So when you're yeah. below 2000 groups, often you can do this the job or something like this, which is kind of, the, which is what's great about this because we've got to, there's no way the apostle Paul could have planted the kind of churches that we plant in America because he was making tents on the side and stuff to plant yeah. an American church. You got to have like 80 hours a week. Evidently Paul was planning the kind of churches that you can still have a job and plant. And they were some yeah. of the most effective and healthy churches ever. So, um, so in our minds, um, Isaac, from a leadership perspective of kind of who's full time and who's do, you know, spending a lot of hours doing this, we're going to discover who those people might be based on their fruitfulness rather than identify them from the beginning. So and then, say, and then Isaac among the lost, I think I already mentioned this, once we find a person of peace and we see a group get started, once that group comes to Christ together and are baptized, soon after, 
we start training all of them to discover who the leaders are there. And then we're encouraging the church to go out and do what was done with them. Yeah, nice. Isaac, did that answer your, I kind of talked around your question. Did yeah. that answer your question specifically? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's great. I, well, I just love the concept of leaders make themselves known. That's that's a great uh, thing to be aware of. Are there some things that cue you? Like, I mean, obviously, if the guy or woman is starting to rally people around and take initiative, those are some marks of leadership. But are there qualities like what are some of those qualities that they begin to demonstrate where you're like oh okay this this person's starting to to lead you know people yeah so i i would say the the main one would just be fruitfulness and disciple making for sure okay if you're seeing groups started and as there is and they're seeing multiple streams and they're seeing multiple generations and they're giving leadership to some of this but then i would say isaac in the churches for example when they elders to say the of unbelievers comes to christ they're baptized in time, like Paul would go back and help them appoint elders. Um, we're looking for 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 kinds of character. So with leadership, it's not just about fruitfulness. It's also about, you know, integrity and character. Obviously. Character, yeah, so absolutely. We, we, Isaac, you know, but here, here's, here's the truth, Isaac. It seems like those folks that are discovered to be great leaders because they're making disciples and playing churches, they often demonstrate already first Timothy three and Titus one, which is probably why they're effective. You know what right. I mean? Because yeah, totally. totally. Who wants to follow a spiritual leader that's not first Timothy three or Titus one. And yeah. so it, it's, it tends to be the case that those things would probably already characterize those folks, but we've got leaders, even at a local level, Isaac in a DMM church, they may not be, starting tons of groups, but we also have leaders that are like elders that are established in churches. And then you have leaders that might be, you know, leaders of um, 10, 20, 30 groups, leaders of hundreds of groups, that kind of thing. And then you've even got catalytic leaders, Isaac, who might go to a new area to start a new work. Again, a lot of that is discovered rather than identified. That's amazing. Uh, the number of groups someone will manage, um, yeah, I'm, I'm always interested in uh, how you guys set that up. Uh, are those, do those guys meet monthly with those people that they're managing and are they training them as, or is that more something the staff would do or it's more on their capacity, I guess? Yeah. And, and again, when, when I say if somebody oversees a hundred groups, they, it may not be direct. It may be multiple streams and they've got leaders under them too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. Um, but I would say when, when somebody's an effective group starter, when they're coaching kind of their persons of peace or the leaders of the groups, they might coach in groups, Isaac, so they don't have to have 15 different meetings a week, you know, because they yeah. probably have a job. So, for yeah. example, just take me, you know, we've started maybe 250 groups now, but I, I wouldn't be working with all of the leaders of those groups. You know, we've sure. got leaders that are under uh, some of us that have started some of the groups and leaders under them and that kind of thing. And usually you guys in movements around the world, if I say we've started 250 groups, that doesn't mean 250 are active. I think I talked about this in the book. Um, mm -hmm. you're trying to start as many groups as you can because most won't stay active, right? Most majority, at least 75%, maybe even up to 90% will flake at some point just because they're not good soil, you know? So you're yeah. trying to, even if you have to start 10 groups to get one church, but well, you're hoping you can, you can start four groups and get a church. I think in our context, uh, overseas, they'll often see that. You start four groups, three flake, you get a church out of one. Four groups, and Isaac, I mean like lost people. They're getting to meet together, doing discovery Bible study. One of the four might come to Christ together. I would say it's not even, um, uh, you know, that, that many, um, that high of a percentage in uh, our work, 25%. I'd say it's, it's lower than that. Maybe... Wow. Less than that, for sure. So, so whatever the number is, whether it's 10% of uh, groups become churches or 25% of groups become churches, you're aiming to start as many groups of getting as many groups of lost people together, reading God's word and hearing from God as you can, so that you might have some that would um, pledge their allegiance to Jesus or commit their lives to Christ, be baptized and become churches. Yeah. Wow. Man, that's an that's a incredible statistic. <laughs> So, well, and Isaac, Isaac, here's why this is so important, you guys, and you'll find this as you start to uh, begin to implement this in some way, is one of the very important things early on with DMM is to keep your expectations very low. <laughs> and the reason, that doesn't, that doesn't sound inspiring, right? The reason you keep your expectations very low is so you're not easily discouraged. 
So <laughs> here, without some of these numbers, people go start two groups and they're like, I can't even believe I hadn't seen a church started yet. It's because their expectation was, I'm gonna start a couple groups and they're all gonna become churches. That's not true. So the right. expectation should be, I might have to start 10 groups to get a church. And Isaac, we tell everybody, it is common, even in the movements around the world, Isaac, they have to talk to 100 people to find one person of peace. Yeah. But when people come to us complain, I went out among the laws and I talked to 25 people. I don't think I found a person of peace. Well, you need to talk about four times that number of people before you probably even have a chance of finding a person of peace. So we just <laughs> have to have our expectations low so that we're not discouraged when we go out, talk to some folks, and we don't see anything. We've got to scatter a lot of seed to find that good soil because you've got, you know, some's fallen on the path and on the rocky soil and the weeds, you know, so you got to find the yeah. good soil. So you got to scatter seed. Wait, so you mean making disciples is hard no matter how you try to do it? That's, yeah. that's crazy. Requires hard work and a lot of, a lot of seed scattering for sure. Uh, it helps Isaac. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate yeah, it. Um, it's good. I have a, any, anyone else have a question? Josh, you, you got you any questions you want to ask here before I ask the couple? I'm, I am watching the clock here, so. Oh, go ahead. I'm enjoying listening. <laughs> uh, Chris, Chris, and that, this isn't, this isn't a practical question. This is just more of like, I guess, dealing with the process or navigating emotionally the process. You talked about how the, how traditional churches are the biggest persecutor of those pursuing movement and, uh, I have found, and I don't want to be like this pansy, you know, like I got my feelings hurt. Shut up, Isaac. And, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> but I have, we have, I mean, all of, the, all of the pushback, the opposition, all of it has come from Christians. And I live in a place that's 98% Mormon. <laughs> and so, like, I'm not, all of the difficult stuff has come from Christians. And so how, I mean, have you obviously in my church was never as large as what you guys are doing in texas at our height we were 125 people um but we're on support like other churches give to us as a missions work how do you or maybe it's just a cliche without the cliche of just look to jesus i mean how did you practically navigate pushback from other believers that's supposed to be on the same team as you well, and the good news, uh, Logan, for you is that your experience is common to man. You just have to hear that so that you go, I'm not the only one dealing with this. <laughs> Logan, let me tell you a horrible story. Are you ready for, are you ready for this? This is going to encourage you because it's so bad. So uh, um, this is in a part of India, Logan. There's this movement, right? and I know, the, I know the missionary couple, and it breaks out, and they're seeing extraordinary things. I think in six or seven years, they saw like 50,000 churches planned. Just amazing. And so they're out one time, like at night, you know, when they wouldn't get in trouble and they're baptizing their disciples, right? And the legacy church in the area, which in India, there's hardly any legacy church. There's hardly any believers in India, but count on the few that there are, you know, not, not, not everybody was doing, but you know, there's quite some legacy churches in the area. I call them legacy because traditional, sometimes people don't like that word, but whatever you want to call them in the area that were coming out, Logan, to their baptisms and criticizing them while they were baptizing their disciples. It gets worse, trust me, it gets worse. So, and they're asking, by what authority are you doing this and where'd you go to school and da 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 and you can't baptize and all this. Then, Logan, soon after, some of them get arrested. Not the legacy folks, some of the folks that were um, saved out of the movement get arrested. Guess how they were found and arrested? The legacy church went to the authorities and told on the activities of these folks and movements that were seeing multiplication of disciples. And some of them got arrested because they were turned in by their brothers and sisters in Christ in the legacy churches. Does that not blow? That is absurd. 